Big changes afoot in UK drone regulations after today's announcement from the CAA that UK will be implementing their own class marking system, similar to, but not necessarily the same, as the existing EASA uh, C classifications. But the real killer, remote ID for all drones over 100 grams is coming. So let's take a quick look. Hello, I come in and I play with drones and with today's announcement, some of that play is about to get easier whilst other areas is going to become a little bit nasty. Today, the UK CAA published their intentions for UAS or unmanned aircraft systems in the UK, which I will link to down below for a little bit of light reading. But I can summarise the main points, though, with some good and some, well, not so good, to be honest. So first off, let's do the positives. After rejecting the EASA-based class markings a couple of years ago, CAA are now proposing to bring them back with the introduction of new UK class marks from UK0 to UK6, which will have some overlap, but will also have some differences from the EASA-based C markings. Now, this makes good sense to me, um, as a lot of work has gone into deriving the safety requirements for these classifications, so drones bearing them should actually benefit from the additional freedom to fly in more places. But in bringing back classifications, we get a huge, huge plus. Easily the best bit of news from today's document is the intention to allow bigger drones like the um, Air 3S and the Mavic 3s to fly in more places, dropping the minimum distance requirements for where you can fly and how far you need to stay away from uninvolved people. They are proposing to allow C1 and UK1 models like the Air 3S C1 label to fly over uninvolved people to harmonise, as they say, the requirements with existing EASA C0 and C1 models in the A1 category or flying close to and over people. Now, those rules for C1 models like the Air 3S allow you to fly in areas where uninvolved people are present but with no intentional overflight of people. This means bigger models will no longer be relegated to open countryside and will be able to be flown in most areas that you can currently fly smaller drones like the Mini 4 Pro, which is absolutely great. As said though, the C1 models have to be under 900 grams. So any new models released in the near future that are heavier than 900 grams may well have a C2 label and that is not mentioned anywhere in today's release. Anyway, the document then goes on to confirm some existing rules that aren't specifically as clear as they could be, like where you can fly smaller drones or legacy unclassified models. But a few key points here include confirming the minimum separation distances. Um, that, that's going to be horizontal, not a bubble when flying larger models. Um, another key point clarifies the minimum distance for larger drones of 150 metres from residential, commercial industrial and recreational areas. Amazingly, the CAA had intended to also add individual buildings to that restriction until it was pointed out in enough numbers that this actually would give buildings more protection than a person out walking because a person only requires 50 metres separation. So they have kind of cleared this up and have said they're going to recommend a solitary building in open countryside will be just 50 metres, not 150 metres. And a few buildings, crucially, this is a really good point, few buildings would not necessarily make it a residential or congested area. So again, that's very good because current guidance from the CAA does class a single house as making it a residential area. But look, all those little things. Um, go on to some of the other main points. Another good point is renaming the subcategories of flights, uh, A1, A2 and A3. They're going to be now known as uh, over, near or far away from people. All good stuff there. And also good in my opinion is the new requirement for all people flying small drones over 100 grams to obtain a flyer ID by completing the free flyer ID test. Now, I have always thought it was absolutely crazy to have to pay your annual £12 or whatever to register as an operator ID for these sub 250 gram drones, but not have to take any online test, which actually helps you and teaches you the basics of how and where to fly. I've always encouraged people to do that. And so for me, this little change makes good sense. Sadly, that is where I think all the good stuff ends because the real sting is in the fourth set of recommendations where they recommend the introduction of remote ID for all drones over 100 grams with a camera. 
Now, they want to bring that in in two stages, with the 1st of January 2026 being the first deadline for models with the new UK labels of 1, 2, 3, 5 and 6 classifications. However, those are yet to be defined. Uh, the second deadline from the 1st of January 2028 is for all camera drones over 100 grams. All model aircraft, home built and legacy aircraft not sporting the UK uh, class markings. Now that last part is actually very interesting. That wording is clarified in section 5.12 to make it clear that only UK class models must comply by that first deadline in 2026. So to clarify, any drone you own today will not have to broadcast remote ID until the 1st of January 2028 because there are no drones currently supporting or sporting the UK markings. But if you buy a new drone in the future that has got one of the new UK class marks, remote ID comes in at the beginning of 2026. They do mention exemptions for remote ID of being flown within the confines of a recognised flying club. Other Article 16 exemptions for flying will remain in place. And as a final touch, they specifically mention that any add-on remote ID module fixed to an old legacy aircraft will count towards that aircraft's weight, which may of course knock it into a higher weight category. And after that little bombshell, they finish off with a proposal for mandatory introduction of geo-awareness uh, for larger drones. And that means pretty much what happens today. The drones have to know where they're flying via GPS. That will enable the use of geofencing to try and stop drones from flying in unauthorised areas, which probably isn't a bad thing as long as that database is managed right and kept up to date, which it probably won't be. Oh, and the final little thing, new requirement for flashing strobe uh, to be put on uh, for night flights. So that's a summary of all those uh, little uh, changes. Let's go back to that big one, remote ID. Uh, why the fuss? And why was this rejected by over 85% of respondents to their uh, call for consultation? And yet it was still included. Well, the CAA argue it's needed to make possible to differentiate between legitimate UAS operators and from those misusing UAS, enabling more effective enforcement and deterrence. Remote ID has already been brought in for the USA and initially it is very easy to say that if you're not doing anything wrong, then what is the issue? Well, there are issues that have been pointed out by the Grey Arrows Drone Club, representing over 26,000 hobbyists in the UK. And they have been lobbying very hard against remote ID with wide ranging concerns. Now, look, there are many arguments against remote ID and few, frankly, tangible arguments for it given the ease with which it can be spoofed or switched off by those who want to disable it. As ever, those that do the right thing are going to be impacted, while those that want to do the wrong thing will just ignore it. The data broadcast by Remote ID includes a lot of information, unencrypted and available to anybody running the right app on an Android phone. Crucially, it includes the location of the flyer. And the apps already provide notifications of any drone flying nearby. So anyone with a beef can use the app to go and pick a fight with the person flying their drone quite legitimately, even if it's in their own back garden. Of course, there's also the concern of third party companies harvesting the data and keeping a record of all flights made in particular areas. I don't know, think about CCTV and how that is used by councils to issue parking tickets and bus lane violations remotely. And you can see where this sort of thing can go, because depending on the technology used, the information can be broadcast up to around three miles or five kilometres. Or if the uh, nuclear option of networked remote ID broadcasting is taken, then that could mean the data from all flights, all of the time, in all locations, could be harvested and analysed. So, not great. Look, I'm not here to argue for or against it, although clearly I am definitely not in favour of it. Uh, but either way, this is what's coming. Probably. Because nothing is actually definite yet, the Department of Transport have to approve these recommendations. In saying that though, they do usually do what the CAA asks them to do. So, there we are. Lots to take in and lots to think about there. Some good points and some bad points. And I would love to know what you think of this in the comments below. Do you think remote ID is actually a good thing or a bad thing? And what about the other changes allowing bigger drones like the Air 3S to fly more places? Um, either way, look, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. 
I'll put a link to that document in the uh, notes below. And I'll also do a link to the Grey Arrows Drone Club uh, discussion on this particular issue as well. Either way, big changes are coming for us here in the UK. Until next time, have fun. Happy flying.